I'll give you that much. We have a uh, first-time guest on the program. That's another nickel in the can for me every time we have a first-time guest. Five more cents to the Rob account. Jeffrey Deaver, best-selling author himself. Jeffrey, good morning. How are well, you? Thank you, Rob. John and John, good to be here. What a delight. I've been listening to your lovely banner and looking forward to a chat today. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, James Bond. Yeah, my name is Deaver. Yes. Jeff Deaver. What's your connection to James Bond? Well, that's an interesting story. I was um, driving down the highway some years ago, about 11, 12 years ago. My agent called me up and said, Jeff, I've got good news. Uh, the Ian Fleming estate, and Ian Fleming passed away in the mid-1960s, um, is aware of your books. And they said, uh, would Jeff be interested in writing a continuation Bond novel? Now, uh, Fleming died, as I say, in the mid-60s, but the franchise was so popular, the estate has uh, enlisted other authors to write. And I grew up reading reading Bond, and I thought for, let me see, was it four seconds or five seconds? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so I wrote the book called Carte Blanche, and it was uh, it did uh, did quite well. And, uh, you know, people ask me, well, is it going to be a movie? And the um, there has never been a continuation book movie. Why? Because you have to pay the author for the rights to then give it to a screenwriter who then gets paid so they just send it to scriptwriters originally and say write write me a bond book where there's a lot of special effects and no heart sorry i'm just giving away my <laughs> own feeling it's you know it's all right gadget 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 there wasn't any bitterness there we didn't we didn't <laughs> sense didn't any, any. No. Uh, you know what i'll tell you this the original books and i know we're here to talk about myself however uh the original bond books were really quite meaningful you know james bond wanted to get married he was looking for the right woman, and he could. He was disappointed. He was sad a lot. You know, he was an assassin. The, the double O didn't mean he could shoot back if somebody was shooting at him. It meant he walked up behind somebody and shot them in the back of the head. And after he did that, it would. Uh, he'd be. He'd go into this catatonic state for like three months. He couldn't work because he'd taken a life. And now you know, it's, eh, eh, machine gun him down. And, sure, that's what we do now. Yeah, exactly. So I got along this line. I got a Bond question sure. for you. Mm -hmm. Who is uh, who is the best James Bond? Uh, well, Connery for me, largely because although Lazenby was quite good, I mean, he, he I think he was only in one, but he was quite good. But Connery because he looked like Bond, and Daniel Craig, uh, you know, doesn't. I'm sorry, he just doesn't look like Bond. And and I read the books from, <clears throat> from the time I was like six years old, and you're thinking Bond, a kid reading Bond, you know, that was the 1950s. The books were very tame. Mm -hmm. There was no obscenity. Um, were the suggestive names the same? Well, interesting. I won't even mention that name on the air, That'd but you good. know that word. No, I that do. word. That word did not mean what we think it did back then. It was an endearment that parents used for their their daughters. It goes back to the 1800s, and. Um, but I'm glad we're being in live radio. Has, one has to be in the morning, still, it's still a word of endearment, I yeah. believe, but I'm not sure what word you're speaking yeah. of. Yeah, but uh, anyway, I could go a lot of places in that, but not. So, hi, guys. What, let's talk about my book, shall we? Yes, let's talk about your books, Jeffrey. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Gilstrap, give us some background here. Is, uh, is John's idea to invite Jeffrey in? I have known Jeff since, I think, 1995. Mm -hmm. He blurred my first book, which is the... And a fine it, it, fine it, book it was. And, and it, was, it was a stunning blurb. Give, cancel... Cancel your plans for your dinner date, uh, and yeah. it, was, it was really it was, it was a stunning review. It was a good book. And yeah. Nathan's Run. Let's Nathan's sure Run. We, Nathan's we, Run was we'll, the name of the, we'll the book. That. And you know, I I was brand new to this, and I didn't understand how any of this worked. And then I saw that Jeff was doing a book signing in Woodbridge, Virginia, at a Crown Bookstore that doesn't exist anymore. I remember Crown Books. And yeah. Yeah, he was one. sitting there. Now you have to. Jeff Jeff is an internationally best selling. I mean, how many people come to your Italian events? thousand yeah nine hundred so, thousand yeah. um so he's he's a big deal but in 1995 he was sitting at the, like i do now he sits in the table by himself and just lonely and and so it went up and we chatted and started a, a weekly happy hour yeah, that yeah. Uh, it off, is going so. on like 30 years now so yeah. was this this was after nathan's run came out or um did? nathan's run was about to come out about to come out okay so yeah. it had been published and he had gotten the advanced readers copy but it hadn't quite how did you get about to asking jeff to do a, uh, i don't the the, the publisher, publisher just that. sends it out and we i don't think we even shared a publishing company i don't know how yeah. that happened but uh i get a lot of these things and I, I do read the book before i blurb it because i won't even give you these details but somebody sent me a book hit it hit it off quite well with this fellow at a, a writer's conference sent me his book and uh I uh, asked for a blurb, and I, 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 you know, sometimes if it's a good friend, yours I read, if it's a good friend and I know the editor, I'll, I'll probably skim it or something like that. But I thought, well, this is a nice guy, I'll read this book. It was appallingly bad. <laughs> Beyond, we're not even, this is pre-woke, pre-cancel culture. If I had blurbed this book, I would not have had a career. 
after that. It became a bestseller, but although in certain circles, <laughs> only in certain circles, that's so kind of underground circles. But uh, anyway, I read his, read John's book, and we just hit it off after that. So how many books at this point? 40? I've written 47 novels, uh, 95 short stories, and an album of country western songs. And I used to, I'm a recovering attorney. Uh, so I wrote a law book a long time ago, and uh, I'll, I'll just say real quickly, I know we don't have a lot of time, You've got, I see thousands of questions there, but I, uh, I started writing when I was um, uh, about 11, and I knew I wanted to be a writer then, but I also knew I liked things like uh, food and beverage and shelter. And I like cars. So I knew I couldn't be a writer right away because writers are not prodigies. You know, Mozart was composing at four and Jackson Pollock was sprinkling paint on his mother's, uh, you know, kitchen floor at five. But writers have to live a while. So I always, I picked jobs. I was a lawyer for a while. I was a journalist for a while. And uh, only after, I guess about, I, I guess I published in, in the 30s, my first books in my 30s. But I knew I wanted to be a writer from the time I was born. So your character, Lincoln Rhyme, mm -hmm. is probably, it's fair to say that that's the one that sort of pushed you yeah. over the top. Yeah. So Lincoln Rhyme, tell us about Lincoln. Sure. Um, Lincoln Rhyme, <clears throat> you might know from the uh, listeners out there might know from the, um, uh, the Bone Collector, the movie starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. And uh, I, I was, you know, I, I always look for, uh, for ideas for books that I know my readers are going to like. And I write a very fast paced story takes place over uh, about a day or two. It's got uh, lots of twists and turns, big surprise endings. And uh, I always like, I always do that. That's the formula for writing my book. But then I want to give him something else. And I thought, what haven't we seen for a while? Well, we haven't really seen a new Sherlock Holmes, but I wanted to out Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. And this is way before the, uh, uh, you know, the recent Sherlock Holmes uh, films. And I thought, what am I going to, what am I going to do? Oh, a guy who is pure mind who can only outthink the villain. And so I put him in a, a wheelchair, a quadriplegic in a wheelchair. And he I never thought he'd be popular, but there are fan clubs uh, throughout the world, Lincoln Rhyme fan clubs, not Jeffrey Deaver fan clubs. They don't <laughs> care about me. It's about the character. That was the best cover ever in the history of books, I thought, uh, The Bone Collector. The, oh, it was. It yeah. was It was really, it was spectacular. Yeah. And they really got, so since then, there's been Catherine Dance, mm -hmm. and now you've got Coulter Shaw. Coulter Shaw. Who, mm -hmm. Which is the current book, right? The current book, uh, Hunting Time, is the uh, fourth in the Coulter Shaw series. And um, may I do shameless self-promotion here? That's why you're here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wondered that. I thought I was being <clears throat> modest. Um, the uh, Coulter Shaw series was bought by CBS, and... Um, a show called Tracker will be uh, premiering after the Super Bowl on CBS. So if you're enjoying uh, football, and by the way, I have to explain depending on what country I'm in, football is the, the brown oblong thing that you throw even though the word foot is involved. So if you've seen Ted Lasso, you know, he's in England, it's the round thing, and in this country it's the oblong thing. Well, the Super Bowl is the brown oblong thing. Following that, uh, Tracker will premiere starring Justin Hartley, the actor from This Is Us and uh, directed and uh, created by the guy who did 30-something, Ken Olin, and ask me how involved I was in the creation of this this tenet. So, Jeff, how involved were you in the creation of that? No one's ever asked me that question before, John, <laughs> but the answer is zero. And if I guess we're on camera, so I'm doing a zero mm -hmm. with my, my fingers there. And, you know, that's fine. That's fine with me because it, it, they're, movies and books are two entirely different skills. They're both creative but they're, they're entirely different skills. And um, I don't play well with others. And if you do a TV show or a movie, you've got to play with others, you know, a lot of others, huge, huge cast and crew. And uh, so I get to sit in a dark room and make stuff up. Um, and if you're doing a movie, all kinds of complicated stuff goes on. And so I sell the rights to the book. They take that and they go from there. And I have not even seen it yet. It's finished. Uh, there's a writer's strike going on. We finished it before the strike. Mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't seen it yet. So I'll be uh, sitting there with my popcorn and rooting for one of the teams with the oblong ball they throw back and forth. Now, and... Coulter Shaw is an interesting character, too. Tell mm -hmm. us about him. Oh, yeah. Coulter Shaw is quite, uh, quite the uh, interesting character. I saw a movie that uh, some of your viewers and listeners may have seen going back, dating myself, because I saw it in the theater when it first came out. Shane, the great... Uh, George Stevens uh, movie, Alan Ladd Jr., and uh, little Brandon DeWilta. Come back, Shane. Come Shane, back, Shane, Shane. Come back, yeah. Shane. Yeah. And Jack Palance is the, uh, you know, really the ultimate bad guy. But it's the stranger who comes to town. Uh, Clint Eastwood, the Spaghetti Westerns. 
uh, Dirty Harry, you know, The Stranger, The Loner. Uh, you can have your quest movies like Lord of the Rings. I love those too. But what I really like is the solo guy comes into town, saves the day, and then leaves. And uh, I thought, well, you know, how am I going to do that now? Well, what about this? <clears throat> There's a reward seeker. And I was looking at, um, I guess I was reading a news story. The government, the State Department, is offering a $25 million reward for some terrorist. I can't, I think they may have, may have got him. But can you imagine a couple of guys, you know, having drinks in uh, maybe West Virginia, maybe North Carolina, where I live, and say, you know what, I heard about this $25 million reward. Let's go try to get that guy. And I think the State Department doesn't allow that. I think they're not very happy about that. But what if there was somebody who, who pursued rewards for a living? That's Colter Shaw. He travels around the country in a Winnebago, has a nice uh, Yamaha uh, motorbike, dirt bike on the back of the, uh, the camper, and he looks for rewards and you know rescues people who've gone missing. Maybe people are missing of their own accord. They want to be missing uh, an escaped prisoner. Um, and that gives me a chance to travel around the country and if there are any IRS agents listening now, I can le legitimately deduct all my costs of my travel around the uh, work related the country. Work related. Exactly. So he's like a bounty hunter. <clears throat> he's like a bounty hunter. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Except there often is not a um, uh, a reward. Uh, it is often civilian. It may not be a reward for skipping bond or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and then there are th these bad guys that the police just can't find. They just can't catch. You know. Jeffrey Deaver is our guest here on the program. <coughs> International, as John uh, Gilstrap said a moment ago, best-selling author. Mr. Bodwell, you've been too quiet over there for too long. Well, I'm I'm really interested. This is great. I mean, I'm I am I was a voracious reader back when I used to have time. I've mm -hmm. got bookcases filled with books that I read through the years. Um, I want to talk about something about writing that is this sort of cropping up in our uh, in our national psyche. Chatbots, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I read an article yesterday. There were three or four different people with major corporations who were writers for the corporations mm -hmm. who have been fired because they're using these chatbots where you just say into the microphone, um, I need a story about how to, to you know, fry, a, fry an egg. Yeah. And next thing you know, there's the chatbot kicks I'm, out a story. I'm glad you, you, John, I'm glad you brought that up. I just taught a course in uh, New York on writing. <clears throat> And uh, one of the segments was on AI, and uh, OpenAI is the company that makes um, uh, ChatGPT. And one of the aspects of the writer's strike in Hollywood, it has to do with finance, a lot of it, and paid and residuals. But um, another portion is that we writers uh, want the studios to agree not to use um, it's, they're called large language models or chatbots, the same thing, synonymous, not to use those in the creation of scripts, and. So, uh, and I have, anybody can go to ChatGPT and type in anything. Uh, I'll give you one example, uh, two, two very brief stories. Um, I said, well, I gotta try this out. I wonder what it's like. So I typed in, you can talk to it, but I just typed, same thing. Typed in, uh, write a, a, a par two paragraphs in the style of Jeffrey Deaver, and let's see what happens. And in a second, two seconds, out came two paragraphs. Um, Lincoln Rhyme, short story and the the style was not dissimilar to mine and then it said and Lincoln Rhyme pursuing the bad guy was walking through the Empire State Building now Lincoln Rhyme is a quadriplegic <clears throat> he's in a wheelchair he doesn't walk anywhere so chatbot kind of got that one wrong but on the other hand so I'm teaching my course and uh, the subject is uh, writing commercial fiction you know you write something and get paid for it that's what John and I do. That's what this is all about. And uh, I said, well, you know, um, let's talk about artificial intelligence now to the class. And, uh, you know, chat GPT, that's the most popular, but there are other ones out there. And I said, uh, well, you know, I'm not going to go through it now because I don't have it memorized, but large language models, these chat bots can, they're going to summarize, uh, are very clever at putting together things and they can give us a new uh, sense of language. However, they really lack the um, you know, the nuance and the, uh, the connection that writers can bring to the page. And then there was some other stuff. And so I finished that and I looked up and I said, uh, that was written in response to my question on chat GPT. How should chat deal with fiction? 100%. That's what the chat bot had written, criticizing itself. So in answer to your question, right now, uh, it's not 
going to be a danger. Uh, I shouldn't say a danger. Right now, it's not going to be um, a viable alternative to creating, you know, good, meaningful text. But it ain't going to be that long before it will. But I mean, it also um, at this point it is for technical writing stuff like that. Like we hmm. we're we're a Medicare insurance oh, yeah, agency. Yeah, yeah. One of my oh, one absolutely of my fine. Yeah. one of my guys. We were we were just sitting around talking one day, and he uses the, he like he likes to play around with the chat. Yeah, thing. Yeah. And he he said something into it. He said, he said, can you give me a Medicare 101 presentation? And yeah. 30 seconds later, we had good. this. And it, it was, was very, it was yeah. excellent. Yeah. 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 Oh, th for that kind of stuff. It's but fine. It was, yeah. it was te I mean, it wouldn't. I mean, obviously, it has to be to presented by somebody. It. You have to and double but, check it. And course, there were yeah. there were a couple of mistakes. Yeah. But I can see where people who have gone into technical writing with corporations should be shaking in their boots right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, I think you alluded to the uh, the lawyer who <laughs> presented a case. This is in Brooklyn, in New York. A uh, civil case guy was uh, injured on an – he said he was – well, okay, I don't, I'm not going to make any comments about that. I was a lawyer. We had a lot of claims that were about injuries that maybe the injuries weren't, weren't quite so bad. But anyway, he sued an airline. Uh, a drink cart had hit him so bad he had to sue the airline. But anyway, that's what he did. And so the, the lawyer – just Submit looking down to make sure there aren't any injury attorneys who are sponsoring this segment. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> Keep going. On the other on hand, yeah. if, there's, if there's an attorney, I was on a plane the other day. If there's an attorney, I, I felt discriminated against because the height of the ceiling in the bathroom was way too low. You can go we'll on sue, now. Well, no, we'll sue for that one. That's yeah, easy. I was injured through no fault of my own. I've got to, I've got to get my uh, my West Virginia ticket so I can handle that case if you like. Well, um, anyway, but so the lawyer submitted the brief. Seven cases: a Delta, uh, you know, Jones versus Delta, so and so versus uh, TW or whatever it was, cases uh, in which liability was found for the uh, against the uh, airlines. Everyone, was, the chat GPT made them up, completely made up. And then he, to double check before he submitted the brief, he asked chat GPT, which had created the, 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 um, the, the cases, are these real cases? And chat GPT said yes. And that was the <laughs> response. I mean, literally, that was the response. And then the, the defense, um, you know, cleverly, said, as defense always does, let's check this. And they couldn't find him anywhere. And uh, they they went back and looked at his records, and he he, he didn't do it. It wasn't evil. And you research stuff on, online anyway. All lawyers do, and the computer spits it out. It's just that the computer has records that go back hundreds of years of these cases, the real cases, uh, you know, Lexus and Nexus, things like that. Well, this the uh, chat GPT, the large language models, they make this stuff up. They had learned about cases. They learned about airlines, and they just put it all together. And uh, he said, uh, uh, I promise, sir, I will not do it again. And I don't know what happened. He's probably not going to lose his license, but it, it'll be consequences. He probably should lose his license yeah. or at least be uh – you know, chastised. By oh, the there bar. will be something I mean, suspended. suspended. I mean, that's. I'm sure that's going to happen. I mean, that's something that needs to come out, and and where all lawyers need to know, you can't. I mean, you can't. Well, do well that. imagine if it were a criminal case, and you got an in innocent defendant, and that happens all the time. And the, you know, the the defense lawyer and some, uh, you know, the defense lawyer, they're often public defenders, way overworked, and just throw something together quickly. Oh, it doesn't work. Guilty. And, you know, death yep. penalty. Hey, before we go further down the lawyer rabbit hole, let's sell your latest book here. Oh, okay. The latest book is called Hunting Time, a Coulter Shaw uh, uh, novel that is the character who will be appearing in Tracker. They changed the name for TV purposes. Uh, after the Super Bowl next January, uh, it's a uh, page-turning book. takes place over two days. Lots of what we call internal reversals. So you get to Chapter 3, and you think the ally cop is actually the bad guy. And then it comes down to a big surprise ending. After that, there's a big surprise ending. Following that, oh, guess what? A big surprise ending because I love my surprise endings. Uh, Denise Apple says you're her favorite author. Well, Denise, thank you so much, by the way. And Jeff Misty Haddock says, can Coulter F Shaw find Jimmy Hoffa? Interestingly enough, <laughs> tonight we're having dinner with the guy who can. So Yes, indeed. But he'll be on the case, really. Yeah. If somebody would offer a reward for it because he's a commercial kind of guy. You know, although it's funny if he's uh, uh, he's a he's a he's a tough guy with a heart. And if he is, um, uh, you know, looking for there was one situation where a girl, little girl had lost her poodle and she got together pocket change like a dollar 17 and offered the reward to Coulter Shaw to find the poodle. And of course, 
that got Coulter into a lot of hot water. I mean, there was gunplay involved, but he uh, he got the poodle in at the end. He said, you know, keep your change. You can buy some ice cream with it. So he's a, he, he doesn't necessarily need the money. Now, if, if the little girl had said, here's 10000 maybe he would have felt differently. But uh, and, and she could have also, at that point, then afforded the ice cream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what the hell was he doing? Dollar no, seventeen about, isn't buying any ice yeah, cream anymore. Exactly. Hey, Jeff Deaver is our guest here on the program. And uh, when I Googled your author name, mm -hmm. uh, Target. As a location for your books came up uh, most, oh, yes, most popularly. Yes, indeed. Yeah, they're, they're wherever you can buy books. Uh, they're online, uh, Barnes & Noble, Target, Costco, all of those places. So, uh, yeah, absolutely uh, pick them up. How do they, uh, what, when uh, you release a book, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any type of an arrangement between particular stores as to where those books are featured more prominently? No, not really. Um, I mean, there have been, a, um, like Target, for instance, uh, there's a, um, I, I think we've all been in Target, of course, and they're, we, they're called the end caps. And so as you're walking down the aisle, you know, you want them to be in the middle of the aisle, of course, but the end caps are the great places to be. And, uh, you know, I, I still remember, I still get excited seeing my book in the store. Isn't that true, John? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's yep. just, uh, in fact, I saw you in my grocery store not too long ago, your book, I should say. And what is your latest book, by the way, that I would have seen? Um, Make something oh, up. Oh, um, man, you got him. <laughs> he's written so many. Well, I have. He has, he has written a lot I, I, I know that Heat Seeker is the one I'm writing now. Uh, and No, this is the uh, one that the, was printed, it, and it was in the bookstore. I mean, one, in the grocery the, store. The one that comes out in August this is uh, this is embarrassing. Six months. It's, he's never been know. caught like I, this. I've yeah. never been caught like yeah. this. Well, you got him, Jeffrey. How about, so. Well, make one up from the most recent one. It would have been a Victoria book, maybe? Well, no. well uh, yeah, White Smoke came out in February. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hey, let me ask you both a question here. Well, because you've written 27 books. You've written 47, I think you said at the beginning of this segment, Jeff, right? Have either of you submitted a book that got declined? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. I, I, I had... I don't. I tell my students, rejection is a speed bump. It's not a brick wall. It goes with the territory. And people are going to reject books, editors or agents, because it's Tuesday, or because they had some food last night that didn't sit well with them. Um, and sometimes they don't need another thriller. They're looking for a new Harry Potter kind of book. But you just say, keep your head down and, and keep on writing. And uh, I had one rejection uh, in the time the days when I started writing, you would submit your manuscript in paper, believe it or not, that paper stuff, we don't mm -hmm. see much of that anymore, um, with what's called a self-addressed stamped envelope. And a lot of your uh, listeners may not be familiar with that, but it's an empty envelope, big envelope, with enough postage on it and your address so that when the publishing company does one of two things, either says, we love this book, and they send you back like big bags of gold, they can use that envelope, or more <laughs> likely, they send back your manuscript with a pithy editorial letter. Well, I got back. Clearly, it was the manuscript, no gold in it. And I opened it up, uh, looking forward to this letter that would say, uh, you know, like, Dear Mr. Deaver, what a wonderful book. This is it's not quite right for us, but if you do these five things, change it, you will um, produce uh, just the perfect work, send it back, and then we'll send you the gold. Well, that's not what happened. Uh, the manuscript had been dropped, and there were it was just a, a jumble. There was a, a, a shoe print on the back <laughs> and my um uh editorial letter was all crumpled up and i thought uh, oh and there was, this is when you could still smoke and there was a cigarette butt in there <laughs> and i you know i thought oh well okay they dropped it on the floor accidentally and shoved it back in i'm uh, now i know that they, they, they drew straws to see who could <laughs> trash that manuscript the most and send it back to me but uh, that's but, nasty yeah. Yeah, lots in the of entertainment money. business, good news comes in small packages. Bad news comes in big packages. That's well said. <laughs> That's well said. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey Deaver, thanks so much for coming in here. It was a great pleasure to have you on the program oh, today. Pleasure, Rob, John, and John. Real, real good. Great studio. Good. And uh, again, where do we get your latest work? Uh, you can find it anywhere, uh, any store, anywhere books are sold. You can find it. Or, and also go to jeffreydeaver.com and learn far more about me than you would ever want to know. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming Thank in. Thank you.